Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can I have a wave? Good afternoon. All right. My name is Daniel. I'm one of the associate pastors here. I'm usually standing right over there, uh, so it's a little bit new, different uh, to be standing here. And what honor and privilege, privilege, I know how to say that word, privilege, uh, to be uh, preaching, to bring you the message today. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, can we turn? Uh, the, the, the passage will be, on the, uh, will be on the slide. Matthew chapter 6. And uh, we're going to read uh, the whole Lord's Prayer together just to, for you to have the context um, to see. And today we have a short verse today, but can we read together from verse 9 all the way to 13? Uh, can we? Are you, are you ready? Ready, set, go. Verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you that you teach us how to pray, how to seek you, how to come before you, Lord. And I pray that you would speak through me today, Lord. Um, that you would speak your word, uh, grant us words of life, words of hope, and lead us to you, God. Lead us to your heart. And Lord, we lift up Pastor Mike and the small team that's in Japan, Oida, right now. I pray that even as Pastor Mike um, is preaching uh, at the church in Japan, that you would use him, Lord, as you uh, are with us here right now as well. To you be all glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, I think most of you uh, by now would know that I am an Australian. I'm Australian by citizenship. I've lived in Australia for the majority of my life. And uh, some of you have heard me speak before. I usually start my messages with something about Australia and something Australian. And so I do the same thing today. And today I have a bit of a confession to make in, as an Australian that we are actually quite unimaginative and literal when we name things, when it comes to naming things, I would even say that we are uncreative. So if you can show uh, the picture that I prepared, this is Sydney, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, I dare say. And uh, in that one picture, we have very three iconic landmarks. First is the opera house that you see right in the middle, beautifully lit up. And the opera house that is in Sydney, do you know what we call that? The Sydney Opera House. And the Opera House is right in the middle of the harbor, right? The the body of water that you see there. Uh, It's a harbor. And what do we call that harbor? Sydney Harbor. And behind that Opera House, that amazing feat of engineering that you see that looks like a coat hanger. It's nicknamed the coat hanger, by the way. The official name for the bridge that, you know, crosses Sydney Harbor is called the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Yes. We have an aquarium in Sydney. It's called the Sydney Aquarium. And we have a service. Um, actually, before I go to that, we have, there's a beach. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but it is seven miles long, apparently. And that beach is called the Seven Mile Beach. And um, I don't know when it was named because it's miles. We don't use miles in Australia. So now it should be renamed to the 11.27 kilometer beach. Yeah. And the outback, right? Everyone loves the Australian outback. And, you know, don't quote me on this because I never read this anywhere. But I'm pretty sure it's called the outback because it's out the back. Right? Most of you don't get this, but we have the great dividing rays, the Blue Mountains, right? that kind of divides east, the, the east coast of Australia. And the outback is literally just out the back of that. Right? The, the majority, like 90% of Australia, is outback over there. Right? That's why we call it the outback. And in the outback, for the people that live there, the brave people, the brave souls, when they need medical service, right? the outback is huge, like I said, 90%. Right? And one of the biggest uh, islands in the world. When they need medical assistance, they don't have hospitals like we do here, you know, like every couple of kilometers. So we have doctors that fly on small planes to go help these people. And so these doctors who go to, the, to help people on planes, what do we call them? We call them the flying doctors. And it is called officially the Royal Flying Doctor Service, I kid you not. So 
there you, hope, there you have it. My confession that as an Australian, we are extremely bad, unimaginative, uncreative with naming things. And today's message is based on Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. And, um, you know, without having it on the slide, you should be able to remember and have memorized what that verse is, right? Can you say it together? Ready, set, go. Thank you. Give us this day our daily bread. And true to my heritage, today's sermon title is Give Us This Day Our Daily Bread. Amen. Amen? Amen. And our points will be kind of similar too. Now, no matter how much I rack my brain to try and make my sermon sound cooler, it's as simple as the verse it's taken from. And the simplicity is one of the things that the Lord's Prayer is actually teaching us. It models us simplicity in prayer. The conciseness of it and the childlike confidence that Jesus is teaching us to pray with. with. Pastor Mike, two weeks ago, uh, he, was, he talked to us about God our Father, our Heavenly Father. He is holy in heaven, yes, but he is also our Abba Father, our Dad. The word heaven lifts us to look up, lifts our gaze to God's transcendence. And it may seem like there's so much space between him and us, right? Because he's in heaven, and here we are on earth. But the word Father invites us to the close and intimate relationship where there is almost no boundaries. There are five verses in the Lord's Prayer. And the first half, the first uh, two verses that you've heard the messages from in the last two weeks, sets the stage for why and how we pray, the focus of our prayers. And the second half that, is, that begins today, you know, uh, verse 11, 12, and 13 for the next couple of weeks, is about what we should be praying about. What we should be praying about. And it's simpler stuff than most people realize. The first thing that Jesus teaches us to ask for for ourselves is bread. Simple. Bread. Everyone say bread. Right? In Korea, we're in Korea, so we need to contextualize. So we could also say rice. Pub. Right? Give us this day our daily bowl of rice. Right? Every, every pub sang, right? the table, you have rice. Carbs, carbohydrates. Now we are so healthy and wealthy that people don't even need carbs anymore, apparently, right? Because there are people, and there might be some of you right here, you know, here right now, that go on low carb diets, right? We're so healthy, we're so wealthy that we don't even need this basic thing anymore. But food is the most basic of the basic needs of humans. And in asking God for this most basic need, we are affirming, confirming our Heavenly Father who provides all who provides everything, and it commits us into a life of total dependence on Him. Amen? So our first point is very simple, three words. Our first point is that God gives bread. Everyone say, God gives bread. What does God give? Bread. Right? Remember what I said about you know, Australians being unimaginative? Right? Simple, straightforward. God gives bread. Originally, I had this wonderful, and I thought, a very witty idea where, you know, my points would have uh, kind of like a, a play on words thing where the first point would be God gives, right? And then the point two would be gives bread. So God gives, gives bread. And then the third point would be bread, something, something, I'll save it for, for later. But I realize it's actually quite, it's simpler than that, that God gives and gives bread is not, you know, they're not two points. It's actually one, right? And I had to combine them into one point. So now you are witness to one of the most rarest things in a church, a two-point sermon today, right? I will only have two points. Granted, my first point is actually two points in one, so it's going to be a little bit long, yeah? And our first point has three words that are basically the three parts of our first point, right? But it's still one point, get it? Interconnected, inseparable. When we talk about God as a provider, a common connection is often made to the, the, the giving of the manna in the desert in the book of Exodus. And Exodus, I think, is one of the most interesting books uh, in the Bible. It's like an epic fantasy novel, and I love fantasy novels. Please don't be um, 
uh, don't, don't think I'm being rude. I'm not saying that the Bible is like a fantasy novel. That is not what I'm saying. If, I'm, if anything, I'm uh, comparing the other way. And I'm sure Tolkien, right, J.R.R. Tolkien, loved the book of Exodus. I mean, think about the story. It starts out with a perfect setup, tense, right, tense. And then Moses is born, and there's drama, right? There's action, there's hitting, someone dies, and then there's exile, runs away. And then there's more drama, and then there's a return of the prodigal, and then supernatural wonders happening. And then there's freedom, and then there's drama, and there's a bit more action, and then lots of drama, lots of traveling, and then some drama, lots of walking, and then drama. I mean, you see what I mean about the Tolkien, right? He was heavily influenced by this book. And then there are laws, lots of laws, and then drama, and then more laws, and then more drama. Now, if you weren't able to follow this, what is it like, 15-word explanation of the entire book of Exodus, you know, look up the, uh, the outline and you'll see, well, you know, what I was trying to get at. The eye-opening revelation about the book of Exodus that I learned is that the whole book is God teaching and leading the Israelites who have somewhat lost their heritage and identity as the people of God, who he is and how to have a right relationship with him. The entire book is God leading these people who didn't really have a close and intimate relationship with him anymore and he's showing them step by step. This is how I want you to have a relationship with me. This is what I'm like. This is what you're like. And I need you to, I want you to come to me in this way. This is how you can and how you will have a relationship with me. Now, this is after God reveals his glory to all. He bends Egypt to his will so that his people could live according to his will. And the Israelites are now free. They are in the world, but they are vulnerable. They are in need. And they are hungry, so they start to grumble. And God provides for their immediate and practical need. How? He gives them manna, right? manna in the desert. Bread from heaven, the Bible says. But this giving of the bread, this giving of manna was not a reactionary action. Right on uh, for, on God's part, right? He didn't need people grumbling to for him to realize that they needed food. Right? God knew that, but he may have been waiting to see what the Israelites would do and how they would kind of approach this problem, this situation. And I would have been a little bit disappointed in their grumbling because they didn't even just grumble at God, right? That could kind of be a prayer, but they were grumbling at Moses, right? This is right after they witnessed the amazing power of God to bring them out of Egypt. And they're like, they're not even thinking about God. They're like to Moses, hey, Moses, you know, you just brought out here to die of starvation in the desert. Oh my goodness, come on, right? This is what the Israelites were doing. And so God te- begins to teach the Israelites how he wants them to relate to him. And that is with trust. He wants them to trust him and to depend on him. Can we go to Exodus chapter 16, verse 4? Exodus 16, 4, and it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. God begins to test them because he wants them to start learning. And as they learn, he wants to see, did they really learn? Do they understand what I want them to do? He wants them to learn to trust in his ability and willingness to provide for them, to provide everything for them, to show them and to teach them his identity as Jehovah Jireh, God the provider. And he began with God literally providing bread from heaven. I love this word literally, and rarely do I get to use the word so correctly, right? Because it says in the word of God, I will rain down bread from heaven. God literally rained down bread from heaven. Now, this prayer of asking for bread is one that few of us pray anymore these days, right? I didn't. I didn't. But I do now, and I hope that that's what you will also, you will also do after today's message. 
I was reminded of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the pyramid. I learned this when I was in school, uh, in uh, high school, middle school to you guys. And um, I don't know why, but in Australia, in social studies, they made a big deal of this pyramid. I, rem I remember it to this day. But our standard of living is now generally pretty good. Right? We've gone up from that bottom, uh, the, the purple one, I don't know how good your eyes are, mine is pretty bad, I can't even, I can barely read it, but the, the physiological needs, right? the basic food, water and shelter. Right? Our lives are now pretty good, we live pretty well off that we don't have to worry about that bottom uh, section anymore. And so now we are more concerned with the things that are higher up in that pyramid. Right? Things like uh, the, uh, the self-esteem needs and the self-actualization needs. I mean, think about the needs on your heart in the last couple of weeks or months or even the year. The prayers that you have been praying for the last couple of weeks and months, were they about the physiological needs, the ones that were at the bottom, the ones that are at the bottom of the pyramid? Probably not. We thank God for our daily bread. We do that very well. I do that very well. But do we depend on God for our daily bread in between our thanksgiving? That is the question today. I know a few people who are and have been praying for jobs. And it may seem like a basic need, right? especially when you are incomeless. Right? We need money to buy our daily bread too, right? But I don't think it's as truly basic as the need for bread to eat day by day for this next day. Now, we don't really think that. It's not that desperate. A couple of months ago, someone slept over at our house, at our apartment, uh, because our family went away on a short little mini vacation, and we needed someone to look after our dog. We have a very cute, good-looking dog, and we weren't able to take him with us, so we asked someone to come and uh, dog sit, house sit slash dog sit for a couple of days, and they commented that our apartment was like a hotel. You know, it's, it's a pretty nice thing to have someone say about your apartment. And um, I think, you know, it had to do a lot with how well-stocked everything was. And I take pride in that, right? We have extra towels, you know, in, in the bathroom, we have extra toothbrushes, we have extra toothpaste, and then in our pantry, we have rice, we have, you know, things that are well stocked, canned foods, uh, meat in the fridge, in the freezer, and, you know, just, just various things. We take pride in that, right? We stock it, we buy, we have the means to make sure that our kitchen, that our pantry, that our cupboards are well stocked, that our family is well provided for, which is a pretty big deal when you have a toddler that eats a lot. I'll t talk a little more about that later. But I realize that God wasn't part of the equation. Right? I need God as I pray for the growth and development of my son. I need God as I prayed for a new daycare for him. I pray, I need God as I pray for my ministry, for this sermon, my parents' health, and maybe a, you know, a newer car and so forth. The big things, you know, the ones that we need God for because I can't do it on my own. Because I don't need God for my bread, for my daily bread or rice anymore. I realized that that was really what I was feeling, what I was living out. I could provide for myself is what I was thinking, I realized. Because worse comes to worse, right? Our parents will help us, will provide for us. Our relative, we have relatives in Korea, the government even, right? Pensions and, and so forth. We think of all of these. With, you know, I think of all of these things before arriving at God. And in preparing for this message, I realize that there is a gap between my declaration of faith and dependence on God, my faith, and the way that I actually live out my life, the way that I pray. And I think a lot of you will be able to relate to this. To think that we are able to provide for ourselves, that we do not need God for our everyday needs, the basic needs, is a huge deception, and this is actually a sin. We have forgotten the first lesson in a growing relationship with God, and that is learning dependence. Complete dependence. Dependence with everything, about 
everything. What I realize is that to grow in a dependent relationship with God, I don't get to pick and choose. I don't dictate what I need God for or not. Right? That is pride. And that is actually idolatry. I think we, and you know, myself included, misunderstand the idea of providence. Right? We think that it's God wanting to provide for us because he loves us so much, right? That even the small things, even the simplest thing and basic things like bread, he will give, right? Even, like on a whim, right? Like I don't really need to, but I'm going to give it to you because you're so cute, right? Because I love you so much. We think providence is like that, but it's not. It's not even with, it's starting with. Providence means God will provide, starting with the basics. Starting with the basics. We don't pick and choose when we need God. If you need God, then you need God all the time. Just as God is good all the time, and we confess that, God is Jaira, our provider, when? All the time. Because our fa- because He, because God is our Father who is in heaven. Nathaniel, my son, he comes to me uh, for help with a variety of things. Uh, he's three and a half years old right now. And uh, he comes to me, he just started learning to button his own shirt. It's really cute. He does it pretty well. But until the day that he, you know, the hole that you're supposed to put the button through, he began thrusting his entire thumb into it, that the hole is now too big and he won't hold his buttons. Right? And so he can't really do it. He has too much trouble now. So he comes to me, you know, during, be- you know, before bedtime. He wants, you know, me or Joanne, uh, to, d- to do it for him. He comes when he can't find his toys, the very toys that he himself threw all over the place, right? And it's gone under various things that he can't find. And so I just tell him, ha ha, I told you so. Right? And he comes to me for juice boxes after playing for three hours outside, running around like crazy. But one of his earliest words and his favorite request, favorite thing to ask for, is one word, pup. Pup. Right? In a, in a cuter, higher pitch voice. And, um, you know, and we give it to him. Right? He will always ask for more pup rice. At least, I don't know, one time we, we stopped counting because it was just too, too many, too, too many times. And sometimes I have to give it to him out of my own bowl. I have to give the rice that's in my bowl because we ran out of pub in the pot thing, right? And I don't know if he really understands what's going on, because he doesn't ask me for pub. He doesn't look at me. He points to the pot. He points to the pub soot, you know, the, the, the steam, the rice cooker, and says, pop, pop, really demanding, right? Really confident. And so it's more like for him, it's like I ask, I got, right? So I eat. And then I just think, you know, it gets simpler and simpler. I got, so I eat. And then I just eat. And he just eats and eats and eats. I don't think he understands that I'm giving it to him. He doesn't even ask me, right? He just looks at his bowl and just says, pop, pop. Why is there no pop in my bowl? Why is it empty? And he waits until he gets more pop in his bowl. I think he forgets that I'm even there when he really gets going. This simple dynamic doesn't prove his relationship with me as son and father, father and son. But it is the fundamental dynamics of a father and son relationship that begins as soon as a baby is born. And this is what we are doing when we pray to God, um, our Heavenly Father, for the the first thing that we are asking, the, the simplest thing. We acknowledge God as our Father who provides. And that is, uh, and that the simple, the simplest bread or pup that we eat every day is not from our own effort, right? My son can think that, whoa, him saying that word, you know, is the effort to get that rice. But really, is it? You know, it's not. It is not our effort, by our effort, that we get the bread that we eat, the rice that we eat. But it is provided for by our Heavenly Father. Amen? Our second point flows right from our first one. Our first point was, what was, the, what was our first point? Three words. God gives it one more time. One more time. Right? God gives bread, and our second point is bread for this day. Everyone say, for this day. Jesus teaches us that we should do no more than ask 
for the bread that we need for the day ahead. Enough for the day that is ahead. Can we go back to Exodus chapter 16, verse 4? Let me read it for us again. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. God gives bread. He'll even rain bread from heaven. But he gives with a certain amount of restraint so that he can build discipline in us, his people, his children. Discipline of continuing dependence on God, continuing every day, all the time, not just once in a while kind of dependence. Because the fact is we are forgetful people, right? because we are people and we are sinful. God, What God says today, you might forget tomorrow. That's why I keep my sermon titles and points so simple, so short, so that you will remember them at least for a couple of days more. It's very easy to forget God when things are easy, when things are good, and the cupboard is full. And God knows this. So Jesus teaches us to pray day by day, every day, for our most basic needs, so that we can grow a little bit every day, in the, every time that he provides for us. Now, you know, I do want to say that I'm not saying we shouldn't be praying for the big things. Right? That's not what I'm saying at all. It's that when, as we approach God in prayer, there is a starting place. There is a starting place. And this is the starting pl- place for our prayers of petition. God wants us to focus on Him. But the more we have, the more we are distracted away from God. For us, as prayers, but also for the people around us, you know, that see us as God's children, as someone who say that I am a believer, I am a Christian. Practicing to depend on God for this day ahead of us, immediately ahead of us, keeps our hearts simple and focused on God. Having a lot of things, you know, do people still say bling, right? Having a lot of bling on you takes the attention away and off of God. Right? It's for ourselves and for the people that look at us. We actually end up kind of covering God up with our plenty. Right? We end up with first world problems right? of having too much things. One of my favorite memes on the internet is the first world problem, problem meme. And this one's one of my favorite. Right? I'll give you a moment to just let that soak in. Right? And there's a, there's a huge, long series of these, right, with the same lady that's crying. Right? For those of you, in case your eyes are bad, my diamond earrings keep scratching my iPhone. Oh no, first world problem. But I need to have my diamond eye- earrings, but I also need my iPhone that's made out of glass. That's so beautiful, right? That's so why I guess they have glass, gorilla glass, screen protectors. Right? So that you'll scratch your Gorilla Glass screen protector and not your actual iPhone. Right? There you go. Because we take so much joy in what we have, what we have amassed and collected, and we enjoy looking at those things. Our attention is taken away from God. And honestly, we want not just ourselves to be looking at it and enjoying it, we want other people to be enjoying it too. Right? For that lady who has the diamond earrings, you know, I'm sure she kind of does this quite often. Right? Or, you know, if you have a new watch, oh, you know, what time is it? Every five minutes. Just, oh, yeah, oh, it's only been five minutes, you know, and then five minutes later, hey, let me tell you what time it is, and so on, right? We love to show that off. We love to show our stuff off. And so we end up covering God with our things. This is a sin that we need to turn away from, and we need to turn back to God. We need to learn to enjoy our lives by faith according to what God has gifted us. And this takes discipline and practice. Discipline in simplicity, in enjoying the basics. Asking for and receiving the basic needs every day. This is the practice of, of of living by faith. Basic things that are as wonderful as the nicest Things that you have as your iPhone, as our iPhones and diamond earrings as well. 
I want to read to you、um, a section of passage, a couple of verses down from the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew chapter 6,、uh, verse 25 to 34, it's basically like an expanded、uh, commentary on our verse today. Let me read it for you. It's a little bit long, but、uh, it's, it's very good, it's very pertinent. Therefore, I tell you, verse 25, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you,、uh, are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we eat? Where? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And I would actually add, sufficient for this day is its own trouble. Now, notice how Jesus doesn't warn us about being anxious about your career, your illness, your disease, your vision, your calling, what degree you should be completing, your grades, or your possible spouse, your future spouse that you have been waiting for and pining after. The things that we might call the big things in life. Because You know, we're used to only praying for the big things. And when we experience the,、uh, them answered, we get high. We experience the high, right? We understand and we know the high, the highs of having those big prayers answered. If you can imagine a graph, and、um, I have a random graph, you know, that I just kind of got off the internet. And it's like trying to live from high to high, from a high point. To high point, jumping, right? Just keep jumping. If you imagine this is the graph of, like, say, the stock market or the price of Apple shares, I don't know. Wouldn't it be great if we could just jump from high to high, if we know the exact moment? But it doesn't work like that, does it? Reality doesn't work like that. And in between those highs, when it dips low, it's not that we have nothing, we have not lost everything. We become anxious because we have, lose, we have lost sight. Because we keep just looking up at that far away high point as we are praying of that need that's up there, way over there. And we lose sight of what is right in front of us that God has provided. And so we get anxious. With the wonderful rice, meal, bread that we eat every day, we still get anxious. Because we don't see what's right in front of us. We just keep looking at something else.、Right? Again, it's not that, that something else is bad or wrong, or that we shouldn't be praying for bigger things, difficult things. Of course, we need to. But we are like missing half of our prayer life, half of what God has, and the way that God has called us to pray. So trying to jump the high to the high, it's like, it's, That's when you pick and choose when you depend on God. And that's the heart of my message today. That asking for God, asking God for our daily bread, for the bread day to day, for your breakfast and then your lunch and then your dinner, is getting rid of that anxiety that you have. As you are praying for those big things, that takes a long time. For them to be answered sometimes, for it to happen. That day by day, God is providing for you. And He wants you to know that. He wants us to realize that, enjoy that. And from there, 
gain faith. He doesn't want us to live in anxiety. Because we are called to be a people of faith, to live by faith, right? And faith is trusting God for what He has promised, what He has already promised. And praying and receiving your daily bread, your bread for the day that is ahead of you, is the building blocks of your faith. The building blocks. That is how your faith grows. You pray, you receive, you give God thanks. You pray to God, you receive, you give God thanks and credit. That is how your faith grows. It's like building Legos, right? I'm waiting for the day when I can build one of those giant Star Wars or Marvel sets with Nathaniel, right? I want to buy one of those sets, right? Like a couple of hundred dollars each. Uh, unfortunate thing, I don't know if it will happen because Nathaniel likes to destroy more than to build, and, you know, he's like downstairs, I think, right now in Hope Zone in the nursery. When kids, you know, block, build things with their blocks, he'll just run through and laugh, ha-ha, and smash them. Right? He's a destroyer rather than a builder. So I don't know if I'll get to do this. But when you make one of those big sets with Legos, the first couple of layers, they look like nothing. It could be anything. Right? It could just be a line of blocks. Right? Right? But as you keep placing the blocks upon the blocks, and as it starts, you know, it gets more and more complex, right? The higher and the bigger it gets. And it could, you can make anything. It could become anything. And that is what our faith, in how our faith grows, right? It starts with the bottom. It starts with the first layers. The providence of the bread for this day stands for all the needs of humanity, all the needs that we have. So faith in God for your bread for this day is to have faith in God for everything else that you need, everything that God can provide for you. And I would actually say that it is necessary for you to have this kind of basic faith to have faith in God for anything else. If you cannot trust God with your daily bread, how can you trust God for the bigger things, for healing of diseases, of cancer? How can you say that I believe God when, you know, for those big things when I don't believe God for the smaller things? And this is the proper context of the famous uh, verse uh, 33 that I read just a short while ago. Right? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That phrase, kingdom of God, often throws us off. Right? It's a cool sounding phrase, firstly, the kingdom of God. Right? And we have seen kingdoms rise and fall and, you know, commercial kingdoms and, you know, and, and so forth. And we kind of understand that word, so we get caught up in that word, the kingdom of God. And we as good ministers, as good soldiers, Christians, believers, disciples, we try to imagine what that kingdom is, and we want to deduce what that kingdom is, and what is my place in that kingdom. The disciple, Peter, was doing that, right? He had this idea of a kingdom when he saw, you know, when he met Jesus and he, he saw Jesus doing the miracles and he said he wanted a place in that kingdom, right? And we kind of have that idea as well. So what should I be doing in that kingdom, for that kingdom, to advance that kingdom, right? Is it to become a missionary? Is it to become a pastor? Is it to, you know, do this, make lots of money and then give it to missions? We start thinking in this way, but at the root of this word that is kingdom in English is a slightly more abstract meaning of reign, rule, and kingship. It's not wrong for the word, you know, in, in Greek to be translated as kingdom, the kingdom. It is correct. But rather than that concrete idea of a earthly kingdom that we understand, there is a slightly more abstract way to understand it. And that is, seek first the rule of God in your life. Seek first the reign, the authority, and the power of God in your life, then everything will be added to you. To have faith that God will provide for your smallest needs is to claim to seek this kind of kingdom, right? The rule of God in your life. Have faith in your heavenly Father's power to provide, and He will take care of everything. Everything. Because He knows all your needs, it says in verse 32. Now, some of you might be thinking, 
that everything that I've been talking about is a little bit distant. It may not actually be grabbing your attention or your heart right now. This talk of Heavenly Father, you know, Heavenly Father is far. But, you know, Daniel, you said he's also intimate. At the same time, you know, talks of brain, uh, brain, bread raining from heaven and so forth. You might not be completely convinced of this God, about this God, who is God, heavenly, but also Father, of his, experience, of his existence or his power or our access to him. And I want you to think about whose words did I just preach from. Right in the New Testament, a large chunk of it is written by people, right? Apostles and disciples. Paul, we preach from his letters a lot. Today, whose words did I preach from? Did I speak from? The very words of Jesus. Jesus Christ, who was not, you know, who's not just a teacher or a mentor or a prophet. Jesus is the only son of God in heaven who is the creator of all things. Jesus was sent by God, not just to teach, but to show us the way to God and to be the way to God, be the only way to God. I've spent the last, uh, you know, almost 40 minutes now trying to convince you that God is our, is your heavenly Father who does provide, who will provide. Not that he wants to be your heavenly Father, but that he is but we have, we as humanity, as people, have rejected God as our Father. Or Creator, or Heavenly, or anything. Right? We have rejected God. And that is what sin is, simply. That is what sin is. That is why in the church we keep saying we are sinners. We have actually rejected God. Remember, God is holy. We say that a lot too. And so God and sin cannot coexist. And that is why Jesus had to reconcile us back to God so that you would come to know God as your Father. Not just that distant, holy judge, right, who's shining with a giant beard, but that He is your God and Father. To depend on Him as your Father who can and will provide for everything starting with the smallest needs that you have, the bread that you need to live. Jesus made it possible for sinners like me and you to have the most intimate relationship with God, one of father and son, father and daughter. Accepting Jesus is to accept this message of God's providence and also every other sermon that has ever been preached or will ever be preached. But people forget that. We keep forgetting, and that is why we keep preaching and we keep singing. You know, need is such an overused and misused word, right? Do I really need a new phone, a new smartphone, whether it be an Android or an iOS, you know, Apple phone or whatever, and we get so caught up, yeah, I, I think I need it. Right? We start comparing, do we really need a watch, a new watch that can tell the time and count my steps and calories burned and heart rate that can show me my phone messages and emails with a customizable clock face made out of an OLED screen that is this small, this big, that lasts for two days on a charge, etc. We use the word need very easily. You know, I, I own a smartphone, right? I own an iPhone and kind of been thinking about getting a Fitbit smartwatch kind of thing. So, you know, it's not that I'm judging anyone who may have a smartwatch here, right? And that's not what I am doing. If anything, I'm judging myself. Right? But we do need bread, and so we pray. Father in heaven, give me this bread for this day, please. That is our prayer. That is what we are taught to pray. And so I want us to pray right now. As the praise team comes for uh, comes back on stage, I'd like you all to stand. And before we sing, I'd like us to pray. And before we pray this prayer that I've been talking about for the past forty minutes, of asking God for our daily bread, can we repent? Can we turn back from the focus that we have placed on ourselves? 
the deception that I can, I have, I am providing for myself, my family, maybe even other people. And can we say, God, you know, I have been pri prideful. I thought that I was so able. And I didn't realize that you provide everything, starting with the smallest things. So can we come to God humbly before the Word? Let the Word speak to us. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us and lead us to a place of repentance with a prayer of repentance. Can we do that together? Let's pray.